Aum Arune neva bodhena purvang santamase hrte Tata avir bhavain datma svayame vang shumaniva Aruneva, by the Lord of the Early Dawn, Iva, like, Bodhena, by the knowledge, Urvang, beforehand, Santamase, universal darkness, Rte, when destroyed, Tataha, then, Avir Bhavedat, arises, Atma, the self, Svayameva, of its own accord, Angshuman, the sun, Iva, like. As Aruna, the lord of the early dawn, destroys the darkness of night, when ignorance is destroyed by knowledge, the self arises by itself, just like the sun. Namaste. So everybody loves the sun. Why? Because it dispels the darkness of night and the cold of the early, early morning. And it brings light and heat to everything. Without the sun, nothing could live. And yet, the sun is also considered inauspicious because day by day, it takes away one's duration of life. So, I mean, this is typical in the material world. Everything has good and bad qualities, good and bad effects. But this mention of the sun is as a metaphor for Brahman. And indeed, in the Upanishads, the sun is mentioned as the location of Brahman in one Upanishad. In another Upanishad, it said that the Brahman resides in the sun, but the sun doesn't know it. The sun god, huh? because he's a material living entity, he's a conditioned being, he's not enlightened. He can't be because his job it requires him to be alert of and awake to the material universe. So it's not like he can go off and meditate, you know. <laughs> Everybody would be plunged into darkness. And that wouldn't work. So the, like the demigods, or the, I should say the other demigods besides the sun are all the same way, even up to and including Vishnu. Shiva is the only one who is beyond. I mean, he regularly checks out for thousands of years at a time and just goes into absorption in Brahman. So, but the other demigods, even though they arise from the self, do not know the self. The same is said about the wind, you know, the, the air demigod, the water demigod, the earth, on and on, that they don't know the Brahman from which they arise and who actually empowers them. So the sun is the same way. Yet, Brahman resides in the sun and Brahman's life energy is emitted by the sun, not only light. Light is just a small part uh, of the spectrum emitted from the sun, and it includes prana. Prana, of course, is the living force, the movement of the air in the body. The body is a hydraulic machine, hydraulic electric machine. Huh? So, the nerves control the distribution of air pressure throughout which what is what makes the muscles respond and the body move. So all of this is dependent on the energy from the sun. The sun is a powerhouse, and it lights up the whole universe. Before it rises, even before 
the disk of the sun is visible. The whole eastern horizon is aflame with its light. Uh -huh. Arun. Arun is the name of the sun just before he rises. Aruna also means red. What a coincidence. <laughs> like Arunachala. Aruna means red and Achala means hill. Or actually, that which is not going anyplace. <laughs> Achala. So, in the same way, red, the color red, is very, very important in the worship of the goddess because it is the color of compassion. That's why our background is red. That's why you see a red color on the slides and all of our graphics. Because this work is an outgrowth of that compassion. So just as before the sun is even visible, before the sun disk rises over the horizon, it announces its coming by the pre-dawn light. And this light is red, Aruna. So the sun's name, just before he rises, is also Arun, a red one. So this Brahman is full of compassion. And as the goddess, Shakti, and as Shiva, the Lord, the controller, Ishwara, compassion is his heart. Compassion is her very name, Shakti. Uh, so her form is also draped in red. This is the language of the Vedic deities. And you should learn it. You should understand it. When you need compassion, you approach the goddess, the mother. She is sympathetic to all living creatures because they're all her children. When you need instruction or discipline, approach Shiva. Shiva is Saturnine. He is heavy. Guru. Guru means heavy. So he is giving instruction. Just like in his form as the Dakshinamurti. You know this pastime? Several sages, five sages approached Shiva for instruction in the ultimate knowledge. So Shiva said, I will sit and speak. You sit and listen. So they sat in a semicircle around Shiva who was facing the south. That's why it's called Dakshina Murti. Dakshina means the south. And he just sat. He really didn't say anything. But all the sages got enlightened because they heard his silence, his deep emptiness. And in that emptiness comes Brahman automatically. So like this verse is saying, as soon as the darkness of ignorance is removed, huh, even by the pre-dawn light of the sun, even by the knowledge before liberation, huh, it lights up everything and you can see. Even before the actual self-realization, the completion of sadhana. It lights up everything. Everything becomes clear, and you can operate so much better by means of this knowledge. Why? Because you know who you are. You finally know what you are. You finally know that if you realize Brahman, at the end of this life, you go to a, a beyond paradise, uh, the realm of the conditioned Brahman, the secondary Brahman, the creatrix, the mother, the energy, Shakti, the goddess. This is the home. This is what's called the pure heaven in the Lakshmi Tantra. And in the pure creation of the pure heaven, 
The planets there last until the end of the universe. They're never interrupted by pralaya in between the yuga cycles, uh, the way the lower heavenly planets are, like Indraloka and, and all the other demigods' planets. No, these planets, like Vaikuntha Loka of Vishnu, Shakti Loka of the goddess, Shiva Loka, the intimate pastime place of Shiva and Shakti, in which the whole universe is created. Oh, and so much more is there. It's actually indescribable. Because each person who realizes Brahman enters this Shakti Loka and gets to create their own world. They're not creating, you know, the universe, but they're creating their own universe by means of their wishes. And it's described in the Upanishads, if they wish to see their ancestors, they get to see them. If they wish to see the demigods, that's no problem. They'll show up. If he wants to see the sages, that's even better. Then the sages will come to him. How is this? Because the universal mind, the mind of Brahman, if you will, is the mind, really, of everyone. We just kind of mark off little sections of it as if this is my mind, that is your mind. <laughs> but it's all part of one universal mind of Shakti. And, of course, then the mind of Brahman, if you will, you know, as it were, is above even that. And that mind is thoughtless objectless, complete void, silence. And this is what is revealed by Shiva in Dakshinamurti. And you can hear this silence in the junction between the night and the day, also between the day and the night. But dawn, and especially just a few moments before dawn, 45 minutes or so, when the sun's light lights up the sky before the sun disk rises, the Aruna time. Uh, this is known as the best time for all spiritual practices. This is called Brahma Mohurta. And it, it's the time of day when you should do any form of worship because every form that you can worship, every god, every goddess, are all simply arisings of Brahman in the conditioned world as the different gods and goddesses. They are Brahman covered by the Ishatvam Upadhi, that limiting adjunct that creates the consciousness, I am the Lord of something or other. <laughs> Just like consciousness. Consciousness is divided into subject and object. I am conscious of this. And then, of course, the relation between them, subject-object relation. So this is a triple. And similarly, the gods and goddesses are the gods and goddesses of something, some particular function of the material creation that they are universally in charge of. But it's also described that of the 33 million demigods mentioned in the Puranas, there are actually only 33. It's described from the, in the other direction that Brahman becomes two, then he becomes three, and then he becomes nine and 21 and 108. <laughs> So he becomes, ultimately, all the demigods, and his energy is what performs all their functions in the form of the various shaktis. For example, uh, Rudra has the Maya shakti, Vishnu has the Lakshmi shakti, see, Brahma has Saraswati shakti, and so forth. So... All these dualities, all these moieties of controller and controlled, energy and energetic, that represent the various god couple forms, are really 
Brahman in his two forms, the primary and secondary Brahman. But even those gods and goddesses don't know that a lot of the time because they're covered by this upadi. That I am the controller of, you know, you name it, water, fire, air, space, whatever. So the demigods themselves don't know, can't know Brahman. And that is why uh, my Adi Guru used to say, the demigods are lined up to take birth on planet Earth so they can perform the Vedic sacrifices and get the enlightenment that leads to eternal liberation. Aung Tatsa. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya. <laughs>